affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, 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 did fail her. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday now, coming up this afternoon, as the government unveils new plans to crack down on extremism, hate preachers exposed by Talk TV and now being investigated by the Charities Commission. And meanwhile, George Galloway takes a dig at politicians saying he loves the building but not the people in it as he arrives at Parliament to be sworn in as the new MP for Rochdale later this afternoon. And the Princess of Wales' black sheep uncle, Gary Goldsmith, is set to enter the celebrity Big Brother house tonight and fears he could spill secrets about the royal family. All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Natalia Hawkera. Good afternoon. Ministers are set to broaden the government's definition of extremism as part of a crackdown on protesters. The Times reported that Rishi Sunak is consulting with ministers to update the definition, which the government says is no longer being fit for purpose. A new definition, which is still being finalised, is expected to cover those whose actions more broadly undermine the country's values. Former Conservative Party leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith told Talk TV that the threat of extremism is a huge concern for the Prime Minister. Extremism in existence, of course, it's a minority position. The majority of those who live in this country want to get on with their lives. So this is about a minority, but who have a disproportionate effect. It comes after George Galloway was criticised by the Prime Minister after his surprising win in the Rochdale by-election. New MP is set to be sworn in later today, but has received pushback from Sunak, who has described his win as beyond alarming for British democracy. Peter Ford, the deputy leader of the Workers' Party of Britain, told Talk TV the attack on his MP was Sunak's way of trying to scare the public. There was no extremism on display. And what Sunak is doing is trying to whip up hysteria in the hope of rescuing Tory fortunes. It's politicizing of the situation with the Muslim community is quite shameful and dangerous. The Vice President of the United States has demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, warning that people there are starving. Kamala Harris says that Israel needs to increase the flow of life-saving assistance into the region during a proposed pause in the fighting. She made the comments as Israel is reported to have boycotted talks with Hamas in Egypt following concerns that the terror group would not provide a full list of the hostages that remain alive. The media watchdog Ofcom has ruled that Lawrence Fox's misogynistic comments about female journalist Ava Evans on GB News broke broadcasting rules. The actor turned political activist made the remarks on Dan Wooten's show, which prompted nearly 9,000 complaints, the most complained about TV event last year. Ofcom said Fox's comments were degrading and demeaning both to Miss Evans and women generally. Fox has since been sacked by the channel. Towns across the U.S. have been taken over by an invasion of tumbleweed. Residents in Utah and Nevada have woken up today to find piles of prickly weed reaching over three metres high. In some places, the weeds reached the rooftops after severe wind warnings were issued across the states. And the RNLI is celebrating saving more than 146,000 lives as it marks its 200th anniversary. A service of thanksgiving is being held today at Westminster Abbey with rest representatives from the charity across the UK and Ireland attending. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
Hello, lots of sun out there today, but rain for some areas. We can see in the earlier radar picture, there's lots of rain piling into the southwest of the UK, as well as across the far northeast over Shetland and Orkney. It's a cloudy, damp picture there. The rain across the southwest will be steadily moving its way northeastwards for this afternoon across Ireland, Wales, the West Country towards the West Midlands and central southern England later. Everywhere else, mostly fine and bright, perhaps a bit cloudier for eastern England, though. Lots of sunshine and dry weather for mainland. Scotland and Northern England. Later that rain reaches Northern Ireland into this evening and overnight it continues its journey further north and eastwards, eventually over towards the northeast of Scotland and the eastern seaboard of England, turning mostly light and patchy nature as it does. Further south and west it becomes clear and cold, a chilly night but not as cold as the previous one, but I think we'll still see a frost for many areas as well as areas of mist and fog that will be quite slow to clear through tomorrow. Now tomorrow much uh, of the UK will see sunshine once again but there will be rain across Ireland then Northern Ireland into western parts of Britain later on, mainly showers. And the far northeast of Scotland will also see some spells of rain, but mainly dry and bright elsewhere. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including the latest fly in the ointments for the beleaguered royal family and all eyes on gorgeous George Galloway as he gets sworn into Parliament again. And today we're joined in the studio by political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Thank you for joining us, Reem. Uh, should we talk, uh, before we get to the uh, gist of the show, uh, about uh, this report, this secret report that the Tories have had uh, drawn mm. up? Uh, they polled uh, thousands and thousands of Tories in terms of who would be the best person to lead the Tories into the next election. And then they're talking... There's no names. It's candidate X, candidate Y or candidate Z. Now, uh, uh, candidate Y is a sort of Jeremy Hunt-type character who's actually a Remainer and wants to keep uh, close ties with Europe, etc. Now, that's... The, sorry, that's candidate Z. Candidate Y backed Brexit but wants immigration soft to Brexit, support uh, some industries. In other words, a sop, soft br Brexit. That's basically Michael Govey type. Who, yeah, who would go it. along with this net zero claptrap. And then uh, Candidate X backed Brexit, wants lower immigration and would scrap mm. the mad cap net zero by 2050 Which project. is Suella. That's Suella. Uh, so that's Suella. Yeah. It's interesting. So I've actually got the polling sent to me. I feel like if it's circulating at the moment, I'll pick it up, whether it's Christian Horner's sex, this particular report, or the latest lurgy on the underground. If it's around and about <laughs> the place, get it. I'm yeah. getting it. Um, so no, I'm just looking through it for a few minutes there before coming on air. And it's interesting. They ask other questions such as, and they've broken it down into the cohorts of the sort of red wall Tories, the red trouser Tories, the Waitrose woman, those who now back reform, sort of original Tories, the Cameroons, and they're sort of slicing and dicing all of the options. And what they figured out, <laughs> a bit late to the table on this one, is they shouldn't have gotten rid of Boris and they should have been Conservatives all along. I mean, who'd have thunk? Yeah, I mean, getting rid of Boris, though, I mean, although I think electorate probably wasn't their greatest move, but uh, as we've always said, Boris isn't a Tory. He's some no. sort of Lib Dem, obsessed no. with green projects we'll and carbon too. net zero 2050. He was never a proper Tory. Well, look, I mean, Boris Johnson himself uh, effectively implemented net zero after Theresa May had put it into legislation. So, I mean, I would say that under his premiership, we had Prime Minister Carrie Johnson, the environmentalist, and not necessarily Boris himself. But, look, I mean, what... Hang on a second. What do you mean, not necessarily Boris? Oh, have you I seen his speeches? He's I, a fanatic about it. Yes, and I and I do. I have a theory. So let's that not Carrie, exonerate him no, from no, being no. a gl green on the crap fanatic. On the environment, he was absolutely heavily influenced by his wife. Anyway, that's irrelevant. Either way, he was a prime minister and he, and he failed at doing so. Um, what I think is interesting about this is effectively the Conservative Party going under a identity crisis. Mm, They're not mm. really sure which direction they want to go in. And what we're looking at is different definitions of what conservative means. Yeah. You know, during the leadership election during 2022, we saw Liz Truss arguing for a smaller <coughs> state, for more free markets, for individual liberty, and ultimately for a reduction in the 70-year high tax burden. We saw Rishi 
Sunak then going along and saying, hold on, hold on, we need to slow things down. And that's the kind of managed decline that we've got effectively at the moment. I mean, what is interesting is all of the people who say, oh, we need a Brexiteer to stay in and become our leader and reform the Conservative Party from the inside. Those self-same Brexiteers said, you can't do that, can you, with the EU? You can't make the EU suddenly become some sort of right-wing, national-loving, you know, democratic institution. So the idea of reforming it from the inside mm -hmm. is claptrap. Yeah. And I kind of say the same. How many years have we heard we're going to reform the Conservative Party from the inside and we're still left with just a nonsense? So an, a, a Brexiteer who wants no truck with 2050 carbon net zero targets, uh, that would probably win the Tories the next election. Uh, but for some reason, uh, extraordinarily, they Rishi Sunak doesn't before. seem to be able to deliver that. Uh, meanwhile, he did make that speech on Friday night, mm. which I thought was a very good speech. Well, an important extreme, intervention took his time uh, to Well, yeah, but you know, we don't need to go into the nuances now, Alex. I agree with you. Yeah. The question really is, why did he have to make it? Is that his fault? But anyway, in terms of that speech, uh, we are asking... After he denounced the scourge of anti-British extremism, what should Rishi do to stop it? Let us know. Give us a call on 0344 499 1000. Talk to us directly. Or, if you prefer, you can text us, write talk at the beginning of your message and send it to 87222. Or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. But uh, first, let's get to our top story. As it is revealed, hate preachers exposed by a Talk TV investigation are now being invest investigated themselves by the Charities Commission. Evidence showing speech speeches delivered by prescribed terror group Hamas in UK mosques was handed to the police in November. While the CPS are still investigating, the Charity Commission says it is assessing the footage of any for any regulatory action uh, following calls to strip the mosques of their charitable status. Well, the news follows Rishi Sunak's warning in a speech outside Downing Street on Friday that British democracy is now under threat by extremism. We are a country where we love our neighbours and we are building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. There are forces here at home trying to tear us apart. Well, ministers are now looking to broaden the government's definition of extremism in order to crack down on those who undermine Britain's institutions and values, with a unit dedicated to combating extremism expected to be announced in the coming weeks. Well, joining us now in the studio to tell us more about the Charity Commission's investigation is Talk TV correspondent Holly Hudson. Holly, remind us what our uh, Talk TV investigation uncovered. OK, so back in November, Talk TV found content, uh, videos, sermons from a number of figures at mosques across the country containing what appeared to be very anti-Semitic rhetoric. For example, calls to destroy Israelis and to come and kill Jewish people. Now, we put that to relevant police forces and as it stands, we asked for an update today. At least three of them, West Yorkshire, West Midlands and the Met, are still investigating whether any offences hate crimes, of course, have been committed. And another force, Northamptonshire, has sent its files to the CPS for a charging decision which hasn't yet been made. Now, the Charities Commission, these mosques are members of registered charities. So the Charities Commission have a responsibility, of course, for them. And ever since our investigation, they have been looking into these sermons. But now, the um, campaign against anti-Semitism and a number of other groups, eight other groups in total, are piling the pressure on the Commission to investigate whether these mosques should be stripped of their charitable status and to determine whether any offences have indeed committed, been committed. The Commission um, says it's uh, assessing the talks for any potential regulatory action in a statement. It said the uh, Commission acknowledges the concerns that have been raised about the charities and they are currently assessing all the information available in order to determine what regulatory action, if any, may be required for each of the charities identified. And where concerns have been reported, um, they will, if any wrongdoing has take, been um, assessed, take action to address it. But as I said, the campaign against anti-Semitism, who wrote the commission, 
of course, very angry about all of this, and they are very keen to see some sort of a resolution. They say, we urge the Commission to launch an investigation into the charities with a view to taking further regulatory action and to make a public statement reconfirming that the Commission will have no tolerance for Islamist extremism, including anti-Semitism, incitements to violence and the glorification of terrorism. As you mentioned, this, of course, comes uh, as the former Home Office Minister, Robert Jenrick, uh, calls for stern action to tackle the cancer of Islamist extremism and after the extraordinary intervention uh, speech by the Prime yeah. Minister on Friday, um, in which he said um, that he feared Britain's great achievement of multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy was now being deliberately undermined by both Islamists and the far right. And that is a good, uh, an important point to make. There has also been a huge rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes across the country since October the 7th as well. But we're approaching five months now since um, the October 7th massacres and Jewish groups in particular very keen for more strong, stronger action, sorry, by the police and by the Charities Commission to try and tackle anti-Semitism. Yeah, and the, and the Prime Minister on Friday, you and I have been talking about this. Uh, we disagree on whether or not these marches should be allowed. Alex doesn't think they do. I think they should be allowed. But I keep saying, allow them, for God's sake, police them properly. That's exactly what Rishi Sunak said. Don't just stand there and watch them break the law. If they break the law, police it. Uh, that's what we need to do, in my view. But uh, thank you so much uh, to Holly thank Hudson. You, Holly. Uh, now let's cross uh, to former counter-extremism coordinator Charlotte Littlewood. Uh, Charlotte, as the Prime Minister tries to calm the waters uh, when it comes to extremism, uh, one of the most divisive political figures in recent times, George Galloway, is due to be sworn into the House of Commons as an MP. Why has it taken uh, Rishi Sunak, do you think, so long to address uh, the growing problem of extremism, which over the past few months, certainly since October the 7th, has become palpable. Why do you think... I mean, th I thought his intervention was excellent, but then I thought, well, actually, it's your fault that this has all happened. Uh, why so slow in taking up the cudgel? And what can he do to stop the scourge <laughs> of extremism? Great question, because why so slow? Well, right now, he's facing an election and... Really, this looks like a bid for votes rather than a proactive approach to tackling extremism, because what we need to tackle extremism is less rhetoric and more implementation. We need to take, as, as you're actually already looking into, the Charity Commission and the speed with which they move when they come to investigate and shut down charities is painfully slow. We need to stop hate preachers being able to come into the country in the first place. I know since 2016, I have recorded nine entries into the UK of hate preachers that call for the death of blasphemers. That is completely unacceptable. The only response I have ever received as to why this happens is because there isn't the expertise, the linguistic expertise to ascertain who, what kind of speeches these people are making. We have partners we could work with for this. We could work with India, who has a list of those that are engaging in hate preaching in Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. Then schools, we need proactive support to schools. We have a teacher still in hiding. We have an autistic child that received death threats for dropping a Quran. We have a school that is being harassed and bullied death threats again for their policy around prayer. The Department for Education is not publicly speaking out for these schools, not saying that they've taken the right approach, not defending them. There isn't extra police support. We need a real strong approach to schools so that they can go about teaching. And then teaching, we need to teach around what is democracy? How can you be involved in voting? What does it mean to be a citizen in the UK? Tackle this idea that we we should be against democracy because that's where we are now with our youth. I think you know it's, it's quite linked to why there are so many that wouldn't join the army, for example, because there is a lack of trust in our institutions and there's a lack of pride in who we are from whatever ethnic or racial background you, you may be from, that pride is, is lacking and that needs to be something we work on at a school age. There's so much, so much that needs to be done and has needed to be done for years. I recorded 173% rise in anti-Semitic incidences in schools in 2022 and we have still done nothing about that report. No recommendations have been implemented. Yet Rishi Sunak talks about changing a definition. 
please. Implementation, not rhetoric. Charlotte, talk to us a little bit about the nature of some of these groups, because when you lift the lid off a few of them, and they sound fairly innocuous when you look at their names, and then you find out that they're doing things like advising the police against Islamophobia or being an interlocutor between the community and the government. And yet, when you sort of investigate a little bit into them, you realise that some people on their boards or some of their leaders have previously been connected to organisations which, frankly, we should have nothing to do with. And there they are giving little lessons to the police on how to police. Yeah, I mean, you just need to go back to the 50s and the 60s when we took the Middle East and North Africa's radical crap. So we took uh, those from the Muslim Brotherhood, those linked to the Muslim Brotherhood into the UK. They set up their institutions here. One of the first was set up by someone called Kalim Siddiqui, the Muslim Institute, um, and the Muslim Parliament of Great Britain. And one of his clauses was actually, I have it written down here, the Muslim community may have to define no-go areas where the exercise of freedom of speech against Islam will not be tolerated. The one thing we must not do is surrender the demands, surrender to the demands of rampant immoral secularism. This uh. individual came and set up three Muslim organizations in the UK that have transformed and adapted into organizations that are present today. And it's that thinking that underpins a lot of what we would call the Islamist organizations in the UK that even under the previous definition couldn't be tackled. So what a new definition is going to do for us, I don't know. Uh, your points about what we should do are excellent, uh, really uh, substantial suggestions. And I hope the Prime Minister listens. Uh, but to go back to your point, I mean, I've seen this report, the Talk TV report, with all these mm. preachers making their uh, speeches. And, you know, it's not for me to forejudge uh, the verdicts on what they're saying, but I've heard what they were saying. And it seems to me extraordinary that here we are, uh, four months on, is it five months, four months, three months on, and still we're talking it's about assessing done. whether or not they may have been hate preaching. Uh, mm -hmm. They may have been uh, anti-Semitic. They talk about assessing it. Look at these. Yeah. Look at these speeches. It's pretty damn obvious. So why has nothing been done since Talk TV screened that report? There are two things going on. One is there will be a defence of this is all context. So I know that the verses they were they were referring to in these speeches were these end days verses. So they'll talk about, well, this isn't relevant to now. But it is relevant to now when they're talking about them in the context of October the 7th. If you're talking about killing Jews in the in the present situation, that there is no context of, oh, actually, no, that's just uh, some kind of parable that's talked about mm. in some future that doesn't exist. Not that that should be a acceptable context anyway, yeah. but that will be the kind of arguments that were being put forward, theological, contextual arguments. There'll be parallels to whether well, there are awful yeah. verses in the, in the Bible as well that get referred to, but they're not literal. But they're, they're talking about this with regards to October the 7th. So so you, you must remove this theological context. The other thing is the Charity Commission has the powers to strip trustees um, of, of their powers within charities and to, to remove charities altogether. But they are painfully slow because they follow various regulations to be able to do this. And I think it's about changing the way in which the Charity Commission can follow its own powers, expediating cases. It's about making practical changes. Again, it's not about definitions and rhetoric. You know, it disappoints me that it takes us to October the 7th to have something like this said publicly by our Prime Minister. But actually, this is with no, with no practical implementation. We're still trying to get the prevent review implemented. That is where the focus needs to be. The counter extremes and coordinators, of which I was one, all disbanded because we gave money to extremists. So the whole strategy was disbanded. And, and how embarrassing. Um, but that needs to be rethought and brought back because the whole point of that was to give money to the right sort of organizations that could tackle extremism, like the Quilliam Foundation. Unfortunately, it wasn't fun funded and they uh, then disbanded. So we gave money to extremist organizations. We didn't give money to the right organizations. <clears throat> they folded. And here we are listening to the prime minister give us a speech about how we should define extremism. I mean, we we failed on so many corners. I could write a 10-point plan, 
I really could. You just did it. Please, sort of did in a please, way. please do. You did We'd in love a way. To see it. Charlotte, Charlotte, brilliant to talk you. to you. Thank you so much. Now, uh, come and see us again soon. Reem, it's interesting because I look at what Macron's doing in France, and when I, I think of what might be in Charlotte's ten-point plan, loads of other people seem to be coming up with ten-point plans at the moment. Finally, I mean, first of all, we need to financially, forensically evaluate where some of these places are getting their sources of money. We need to close down mosques that don't comply and don't agree to fit in with our customs and our society and we need to immediately deport those who break our laws with hate speech france managed to put a radical treat preacher from tunisia who's been in the in france for a long time now even had children in france they put him on a airplane and said back you go to tunisia never mind human rights laws you can't stay here and he's turned around and said to the newspapers well if i was in britain i'd be allowed to stay there he probably would be allowed and to. All, he said, all he said was uh, he connected the french flag with satan and he was gone within 80 hours. He'd lived there 20 years. You'd never get that kind no, of resolve in this country. We don't have that kind of strength, I suppose, yeah, within, no, within government exactly. uh, institutions. Look, I mean, I do think there is a very fine line here. And I mean, as a libertarian, I believe in the unequivocal right to freedom of expression. And I think that actually individuals that live in this country should absolutely be free to say as they wish and to express their political opinions. I think just as much as crazy anti-vaxxers should be able to say, say what they want in front of government and Institutions, absolutely people that are uh, that are pro-Palestine should be able to do so as well. Where the line is drawn is when these people are very clear, and this is the point that Charlotte makes, if people are very clearly saying things that are fundamentally anti-British and actually calling for violence. Which I is think against that, the law. Which is against the law. Yeah, so exactly. I, d I definitely think that there is a very fine line to be drawn. There is also a, somewhat of a double standard here. People seem to be claiming that Freedom of expression is really important when uh, they are pro-Palestine uh, 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 protests. But when it comes to, for example, the anti-lockdown protests, many of those people were arrested or you know, other kind of anti-government mm. protests. Those that are deemed to be on the right tend to be uh, uh, sort of come down, by, come down on uh, like a ton of bricks by the police. Mm. But when it comes to other protests, they're not. Right. So there is a double standard. I think that we all have to be consistent. I think that all of those should be allowed. As soon as you start breaking the law, and as soon as you start calling for jihad, calling for violence, calling for oppression in this country, you should be on the first flight out of here. Yeah, and the police, uh, in response to seeing people chanting jihad, should not be going off and consulting interpreters <laughs> as to what jihad might mean. Or, connected to dodgy or, deci or deciding that uh, from the river to the sea is a jolly old song that everybody should be allowed to sing. The police, uh, Sunak was right on the money, exactly what we've been saying, uh, Alex, certainly what I've been saying is, well, you don't agree with this, but I think the me the marches must be allowed, but they must be policed. Yeah. If these people break our laws, arrest no, them. I think marches should be allowed, but not if they're connected to known prohibited organisations. And yeah, frankly, for these marches are... Well, oh, that's not, enough. Not, that's not everyone. I mean, how not can everyone. You prove, no, that's not a reason. I mean, how can you prove that every single person exactly on those right. marches exactly. are exactly. connected to terrorist well, organisations? No, you can't. No, you can't. No, so you what can't, I will but you say... can ban it on the basis that you can prove that some people are. And well, Robin Simcox, the government's well, counter extremist commissioner, has said just that. And many of those people, I mean, many people have been arrested on these protests. I mean, we saw those people that shined um, the, the sort of messaging on, on, on uh, government buildings that is absolutely not allowed. It's illegal. Those well, the people... police didn't say that. The police said it's okay. No, 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 they were arrested. They were arrested. Who was? The, the, pe the people that sh uh, sh shown the sort of uh, images on the onto parliament. But the police said it was okay to do it. They were, I, be I believe, they were I don't arrested. Think they were. So I, I think I don't that, think well, if they, they were. weren't, then that's the bad. The police said it was fine to do it. They said, that they said you can't so it sing it. You no, can't I'm, sing it, but you can project it. I'm, I'm almost certain that they were arrested. Uh, they were during not that time, arrested. But either way, they should have been. Yeah, I agree. That, that much I agree with. And ultimately, we can talk about the the fundamental right of freedom of expression and also ensure that there are not terrorists on our streets chanting things that effectively are calls to jihad. Now, we can have an open debate about whether or not the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is a call to uh, it's oppression. It's a genocidal song. Well, I mean, yeah, again, it those are, those it's are open genocidal. interpretations. It's destroy all Jews and get rid of the Israeli state. Netanyahu also used it to, to talk about his response to the to Hamas. So again, I mean, you know, whether if, if, we, if we're going to apply that kind of logic to the Palestinian protesters, we have to also apply that, that to other people as well. Ultimately, I think there's a lack of policing. There clearly is a huge lack of, A, intelligence in, in, in the 
Metropolitan Police, the fact that they're being advised by these effectively Islamist groups. I think there needs to be an investigation <laughs> into that. It is, it is mad. And also, I think the, the point that Charlotte makes is that because they are regulated by the Charity Commission, they get a whole load of um, of benefits, for example, like tax subsidies, etc. So, you know, there, there, are, there are definitely questions to be answered here. I think that ultimately the police need to be, you know, need to effectively uh, try and uh, take handle of the situation. Mm. Sunak making that speech again, I mean, on Friday, I know you guys have been praising him for it, but I really do think that there wasn't really much substance there. He was no, saying I this is really you. bad. It's... And the speech was good. It's just like, why did he have to make it? Hey, Rishi, it's your fault. I think That's he... why you had to make that speech. I copy and pasted the speech I'd made a week before. <laughs> I've recognised a lot of that. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, he's acknowledging that there's a problem, but there are no concrete plans to actually tackle right. Islamism. Well, that's what I was asking Latin. Charlotte. What, what should the Prime Minister do about it? And that's what we're asking the audience as well. Indeed we are. Now, coming up after the break, a badly behaved uncle is at the risk of embarrassing the royals. Now, where have we heard that one before? <laughs> Kate Middleton's uncle is set to enter the celebrity Big Brother house. We're going to be bringing you all the juicy gossip on that front. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And you're all with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. 
Now, it looks like a badly behaved uncle may be about to cause a headache for the Windsors, but this time it's not Prince Andrew. Gary Goldsmith, Kate Middleton's uncle, has reportedly signed up for Celebrity Big Brother. There are concerns the outspoken businessman could spill secrets about the royal family. Uh, we're still joined uh, in the studio by political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Now, Gary Goldsmith is a colourful character. You can see why ITV has signed him up. Uh, you know, he's, there's been lots of stories about, uh, shall we say, um, narcotics fueled parties that he's <laughs> held. He's lived in the Caribbean. Uh, and uh, he also uh, does not have a perfect uh, non-criminal record, shall we say. Uh, I would suggest, I can see why they've signed him up, but given that Kate isn't very well, to say the least, don't you think ITV should have thought better of this? Leave her alone. You know, she doesn't need this while she's trying to recover. Yeah, I think that's right. And look, I, it's very clear why he was chosen by ITV. Yeah. He's, he's going to make good TV, isn't he? He's going to be—he's going to be funny. He's going to be interesting, and I think that his entire—I mean, his entire background story is incredibly, uh, I suppose, murky is the right word. We don't really know what what kind of things he's been getting up to. There are, of course, loads of rumours and loads of things that we can speculate about. But actually, his entire life story is actually quite fascinating, uh, and you know, the, the details that we do know—that you know, the places that he's travelled to, the kind of uh, very odd parties with very very high-profile uh, guests, might I add. So I think that. He's is going to be quite interesting. There's clearly a reason why ITV have chosen him. I'm quite excited to watch it, to be Didn't honest. he punch his partner? Uh, I, I, I think that that's been rumoured. I'm not sure if it's, if it's uh, been I think, I think it's a conviction. Well, oh, I mean, it's a conviction. One of the things interesting is I think he had uh, sort of asked to go on I'm a Celebrity before and was sort of told, well, no, because you're going to cause too much trouble for the royal family. But that sort of attitude seems to have disappeared now in, in ITV. And I think everyone's just, you know, trying to compete against Netflix and people wanting to watch The Crown and so on and so forth. But, you know, everyone's just sort of lowered their levels of uh, what they think is acceptable and what they don't. It's just a big scramble to get the ratings, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can I just get this on? Let's just get this right. He, uh, Gary uh, was arrested uh, in October 2017 for assaulting Julie Ann, his then partner, yeah, after a junk, drunken argument in which she accused him of taking drugs. He pleaded guilty to that and uh, was fined £5,000. So he's a nefarious character. There's also been lots of stories of his drug parties. He lives abroad. Uh, so ITV are shamelessly cashing in on this guy that that maybe should not be paid any money because uh, the only reason he's getting any money is because of his bad reputation. Well, look, I mean, I, he's definitely going to make good TV, isn't he? I mean, I don't blame ITV for that for that reason. I think that the point that you made, Alex, is really important, that actually there seems to be no shame oh. in, in kind of respecting the royal family. You, you know, the, the king has, has just undergone huge surgery himself for, uh, for cancer, and actually the, the way in which uh, the royal family have themselves have had to deal with things over the last few years following the Queen's death, also following all of the drama that Harry and Meghan have caused the royal family, and now to then have their their uncle effectively being uh, sort of shown off and paraded on ITV, I think is going to be incredibly hurtful. There needs to be an element of um, kind of cultural awareness and also kind of respect for the royal family, which, again, I think it's a cultural thing and I think it's a generational thing. People seem to have completely lost uh, this kind of respect for their for older people, but also for, for the royal family themselves. As Celebrity Big Brother, uh, I think it returns to the screen tonight. Uh, all the ideas are always old in television and that's why later in the show we'll be discussing why Bergerac is back. <laughs> uh, they never have any new ideas at all. Have we got time to talk about the woke head teacher? Oh, we've got to talk about okay. the woke head teacher. Off you teacher. go then, Alex. I'm going to think of this story. So this is a head teacher at a private school. It's always the private schools. People pay money for such dross, don't they, <laughs> in our education system. Yeah, you pay um, money to get a but, lefty uh, head mistress. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just buying into the socialist Marxism calls by yeah. sending kids to private schools. <laughs> uh, but basically, she said that uh, all the houses, all the boarding houses in Devon's Exeter School are going to have to be renamed because naval heroes such as Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake, uh, well, they're not inclusive anymore. They don't represent the values and inclusive nature of the school. Less than positive connotations. I would suggest... What, as those, in, like, defending Britain the, the, you know, those and, you know, two, advancing the, our imperial Two of the people ambitions. who made Britain, Britain great. Def Britain defending, great. defending Britain, defending British freedoms, um, defending British democracy, defending the royal family, defending the very institutions that make us one of the most incredible countries in the world that is somehow not inclusive enough. I mean, I think this stuff is absolutely crazy. You 
you see this sort of thing happen at, and by the way, when I was at university, there were loads of uh, privately educated students that held these very same beliefs. One of them actually told me that I needed to be uh, proletarianized, which effectively in Marxist speak means that I need to be educated because I don't, I'm, not, I'm not understanding fully the impact that capitalism has as, as a working class person effectively. So look, I mean, a lot of these uh, privately educated people, a lot of these private institutions seem to have been infiltrated by this woke mm. nonsense. And I actually think, you know, maybe using the, the term woke it is, isn't, isn't harsh enough. This, this kind of, these kind of ideas are being perpetuated into society, yeah. into these very people that will end up at very, very high paid jobs at, you know, all of our, all of our favorite companies. Mm. And they'll be perpetuating this idea that Britain, Britain's history is something that we should be ashamed of. Yeah. And effectively, mm. they're going to be erasing it. Yeah, and if you, even... if you want to send your kids to, uh, uh, Devon's Exeter School uh, under the head master and mistress uh, Louise Simpson. It'll look, all it'll cost you for your kids to be brainwashed with this left-wing anti-British claptrap is £17,000 a year. <laughs> there a bit, you go. a bit of a pang shop private school, given the most, well, most of Well, it should be. Fees. It should be. That's just something don't, grand don't too much. Don't get me much. started on that fourth plinth. That is just trolling Britain, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> that thing. Now, coming up after the break, Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are coming under pressure from backbencher MPs to introduce tax cuts at the announcement of the spring budget on Wednesday. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and you're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just for yeah. minutes, for... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak are under growing pressure from backbencher MPs to deliver vote-winning tax cuts as they prepare for the latest spring budget announcement this Wednesday. Speaking earlier at a Honda car factory visit, the Prime Minister insisted that the economy is on the right track. It shows that the work we're doing to get the economy on the right track is paying off. Now, I'm determined as Prime Minister to make sure that the UK is the best place in the world to invest and grow a business like this. And that's why we've been taking ambitious steps like making full expensing permanent, which is the biggest business tax cut in modern British history. And it's all about supporting businesses like this to invest in local areas and create jobs and opportunity for the future. I think he actually believes that claptrap. Oh, yeah, he has to believe in something. We're still joined by political commentator Reem Ibrahim. Now, my view is, unless they literally whack off about 10, 10 p uh, per pound in the tax, it's not going to move the needle. I mean, they're scrambling around just to try and cut tax by an odd penny here or there. It's not when they still don't even have the fiscal headroom, frankly, to do that. Absolutely. So I think that what's particularly interesting about the reports around the budget on Wednesday is effectively that the government are going to be leaving with this headline 1p tax cut on national insurance. Now, what this is effectively supposed to do is supposed to get rid of about 200 to 300 pounds uh, uh, each year for each person. I mean, it really is nothing in, in the grand scheme of things. We are already still facing the highest tax burden since the Second World War. Just to put that into context, we have a higher tax burden now than we ever have under the government's Labour government of Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. These are incredibly high tax burdens that effectively mean that we are driving investment out of this country. Now, fiscal drag, there are thousands of people, millions of people being dragged into higher tax brackets as they earn more. Yeah. So we are actively disincentivizing people from earning more money because they're being dragged into higher tax into higher tax brackets. What I would say is unfreeze the tax bracket threshold so that those people are not being disincentivized to earn any more money. But also, Corporation tax. Last year, the government increased corporation tax to 25%, up from 19%. What that did is it effectively drove out investment. You saw companies like AstraZeneca pushing out their investments to countries like, hello, Ireland, right next door, that have a corporation tax rate of 12.5% half of ours. So again, I mean, it feels as though the UK are kind of entering this managed decline into socialist Britain, and effectively what we're seeing is the government continuously taking more of what you earn. Yeah, but I... they, the thing about this government, uh, you know, you, you think about Jeremy Hunt, who seems to think, like, the big winner is to be anodyne and bland. So he goes on at the weekend going, oh, I won't be able to give you 2p, which is what the backbench is. Yeah. I might be able to give you 1p. <laughs> this government is prudent and responsible. Oh, great, that's really going to stall me to victory. Who was the last Prime Minister who said, I'll be prudent, I'll always be prudent? It was Gordon Brown during his very brief premiership, which resulted in a defeat at the ballot box, and that's where Hunt and Sushak... Su, Sushak? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's like one of those uh, mishmash <laughs> names. Uh, like Brangelina. <laughs> Sushak. They're heading for defeat, aren't they? Well, look, I mean, electorally, this is very, very bad. We're talking about... There's potentially some rumours about a cut in or an ab abolition of uh, the inheritance tax rate. Again, these are real drops in the bucket in comparison to the wider issue Sorry. of the tax burden. I mean, Sunak was right in his speech about full expensing. That is a good thing. And full expensing making it permanent is a good thing for, for British infrastructure and for business in this country. But when we're thinking about the wider context of the tax burden, the government have increasingly spent money like sweets. They've allowed mm -hmm. the Bank of England to, and again, this is all throughout the pandemic, you know, Rishi Sunak was Chancellor during the pandemic, let's not forget that. Yeah. And, you know, spending money <laughs> like sweets, allowing the Bank of England to buy up that government debt through quantitative easing, which has meant that we have inflation now. Inflation is too much money in the economy, mm -hmm. chasing too few goods. The government are actively restricting uh, uh, housing supply, which has also had an impact on inflation. So it means that that pound in your pocket is worth less now than it was 10 years ago. Now, talking about government policy. It seems to me when you want a policy to tackle immigration and bring the numbers down, well, they have hand ring and can't seem to do it, can't seem to stop a boat. But when it comes to uh, coming up with new ways to let more people into the country, this sort of legislation just rushed out so quickly that it becomes overwhelmingly abused. And I'm thinking now of the care workers visa, as it turns out that there are gang masters out there who are taking care
cash for care jobs. So people in Nigeria, Zimbabwe, in India. Well, they're being are sold seeing, these jobs. Well, they're being sold. sold so these basically, jobs, people yeah. are coming over to work as care workers in this country with absolutely no training, uh, don't really want to do the job, just want to be in Britain. But they're turning out with suitcases, jams full of 20 grand that they're paying these people to get the job as an, an unqualified care worker. Yeah, this so is madness. It, this is the job. This is a, to exploit a loophole. So they've been charged nine to twenty thousand mm -hmm. pounds to become carers. They have no qualifications whatsoever. So as critics of this crookery are saying, uh, this will result in risk and danger to care home residents. Well, effectively, this is the unintended consequences of loopholes in legislation yeah. that mean that these criminal gangs have just taken advantage of effectively a loophole in government legislation in the UK. And they've taken advantage. It's meant that these criminal gangs are then further being funded as a result of it. So even if we were to crack down illegal migration in this country, there are these various different loopholes, which I think is, is the scariest part of this story. There are these various different loopholes that mean that people are still going to be able to enter this country legally, but through these various back routes, and again, working in jobs that they are severely underqualified for. Exactly right. Now, still with the migrant crisis, uh, and this is what's really worrying about this is people are dying now on a regular basis. They're drowning out there in the channel, and it barely makes a headline. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we learnt four people, was it four, five, really uh, the day, wasn't uh, it? they drowned uh, last week. And then uh, yesterday, a seven-year-old girl died in a small boat uh, which had far too many people in it, and it capsized. Uh, Sixteen migrants were on that boat. She drowned. Uh, but uh, during yesterday, 150 people did successfully cross the channel. So we have a kind of split kind of uh, uh, vote here. What One is they get on these boats and they capsize and they die, or they make it to Britain in uh, relatively large numbers. Either way, it's an ongoing catastrophe, isn't it? It is absolutely a catastrophe. And I've just, I just want to, first of all, say how tragic those deaths really are. I mean, we're talking about not only just working age people, you know, working age men that are able to cross the channel, but, you know, many children have passed away as a result of uh, what is effectively the government's failure to crack down on legal migration. And these are criminal gangs that are taking advantage of vulnerable people. And again, I mean, we saw this story the other day where the French authorities effectively dropped off people on the channel and then... And and went mm. back to France. I mean, I this mad. is really, really outrageous. It's A, dangerous for those people, mm. but B, absolutely outrageous. I'm sure it must break some well, kind of perhaps international crime. It's crime being committed. The RNLI meets, perhaps I'll go further towards France for their taxi service. Uh, should we talk about uh, Wayne Cousins? Uh, well, we've got some footage. There's going to be a documentary this week on the BBC, I think, about the investigation. And uh, this is uh, the uh, cop, the female cop, uh, who uh, discovered that the person she was uh, looking for was, in fact, a fellow copper, uh, Wayne Cousins. So let's have a look uh, at that moment. And she said, he's a police officer. He's a serving officer in the Met. He currently works for the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Group. I knew that I had to tell my, my boss and I can just remember the shock of having to just sit on the floor of the office and say to her, you're not going to believe this. Uh, so that was uh, Detective Chief Inspector Catherine uh, Goodwin at the moment she realised that the perpetrator of poor Sarah Everett's murder and rape was a serving police officer. Uh, just brings into sharp focus, doesn't it, the fact that the police really are not vetting the kind of people who get into the force and they've really got to raise their game here, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, look, Sarah Everard's death and 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 the the police um, investigation that occurred after that really, really has affected many people. I think affected many young women, including myself. We saw uh, the the huge impact that this really had, and actually the failures on the police's uh, front, uh, the way in which they handled the investigation, but also the way in which they handled arrests during her own vigil. I mean, I am really quite quite hurt and quite upset about the way in which it was handled itself. But it also makes things incredibly scary. I mean, you've got young women walking mm. on the streets and being... We can't even trust oh. police officers. Well, no, you can't trust the police officers either to investigate burglaries. I mean, <laughs> back in 2022, all 43 police chiefs in England made a commitment that officers would turn up 
for every single break-in. Well, new <laughs> data that's come out has shown that in half of, of uh, police boroughs, um, there have been no burglaries solved at all. So that's in 48% of neighbourhoods. And now, uh, burglaries resulting in a charge has fallen to an all-time record low of just 3.9%. It's basically not a crime anymore, yeah, is it? Yeah, absolutely. And effectively, what we're seeing at the moment is that so because police have failed so much to, to, to crack down on these crimes, and we're not just talking about... You know, I remember one news outlet called these uh, petty crimes. The, entering somebody's home and burglary... Nicking burgling, stuff, yeah. Nicking their stuff. I mean, also, for, for most people that I've spoken yeah. to that have had um, people burgle their home. It's actually not even about what they've taken. It's the fact that somebody's entered yeah. their home, yeah. their property, that where they've got children or their families in the mm. home. That's really the psychological impact of that yeah. is horrible. And the fact that these people are then not being prosecuted is even is even more horrendous. Now people are taking matters into their own hands. They are installing cameras. They are installing film evidence. Mm. And yet even so, this evidence yeah. is not enough. For even the with the footage, well, well, maybe they should spend less time at protests. Oh, let well. Me, let me tell Tell you, when you uh, step outside your house and your car's been nicked, you do not regard it as a minor crime. Yeah. No. no, and exactly. that's the problem with the police because they think if you get beaten up in the street or you get your car nicked or your bike nicked, it's nothing. No. Well, it, it's a lot yeah. to the victims of those crimes, and they've got to raise their game. Now, uh, Piers Morgan's exclusive interview with Ukraine's First Lady Elena Zelenska will be released on Piers Morgan Uncensored YouTube channel at 5 p.m. tonight. Let's have a look at a short clip. More than 200,000 Ukrainians have been over in the UK staying with British families. It's a huge number of people. Are you very grateful to the, the British families who've taken in Ukrainians? I'm not just grateful. Sometimes I, I'm sincerely surprised at how noble, what a noble thing it is to do. A worthy thing to um, take someone in, in, a stranger, into your home. Well, there you are. That's Elena Zelenska, wife, of course, of uh, Ukrainian President uh, Volodymyr Zelensky. I mean, it's funny, isn't it? We were talking earlier about, you know, we don't talk about Ukraine much anymore. We're not talking about Zelensky at one point. You couldn't get rid of him. He was at the BAFTAs. He was, uh, you know, being beamed at Glastonbury Festival. In Parliament speaking. Yeah, in Parliament. And His now star is have... fading. No, but it's, it's, it's it sad, fading. though. No, we, it's no, yeah, we, it is. But it's, it's sad, really, that, you know, we have sort of lost the human angle to this story. So one hopes, actually, that that interview will bring that back into sharp focus. Absolutely, and I think, look, I, I, I think that the fight for freedom really is on the front of, of, of Ukraine, and actually the threat that Putin really has, and I, I, I think that that threat in itself is hugely important for, for the West and our own interests in itself. I think that, you know, what I worry is that because things have moved on and because the media news cycle moves on so quickly, people have become very used to the idea that there is a war in Ukraine and very used to the idea that innocent people are dying as a result of it and then you get people then becoming less sympathetic to their cause in itself i'm afraid it's the way that it always goes when yeah. you get a war where you know you remember when the gulf war broke out you probably don't uh but the whole <laughs> world was absolutely yeah, like glue this, this is astonishing within four weeks we're all a bit bored with the gulf yeah. war i'm afraid mm. the way it goes and and uh there's a kind of war fatigue about ukraine and gaza has taken over and that is the way of the world yeah. no, sad I, but true what I, what I think so i think you're absolutely right and i think that obviously this is the way things work and it's the way the news cycle works but the war in ukraine is a war in europe this is a war that is on our mm -hmm. doorstep and so i would suspect that the the longevity at least of the news cycle uh, sort of remains a little bit longer because yeah. people don't, no, people don't yeah. feel the threat here yeah. people well, don't realize that if putin takes that, ukraine uh, if it thank was in you. Sussex, maybe. Maybe. But the fact yeah. is, it's a long way we, away. Thank you ever so thank much. You, thank you, Rain. Intelligent interventions. Now, that interview drops at 5 pm tonight on the Piers Morgan Uncensored YouTube channel. A very important interview to watch, I would say. Indeed. Now, coming up after the break, we'll be looking at the Charity Commission's investigation into hate preachers in UK mosques following Talk TV's exclusive expose. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treat girl.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. That's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Cross Talk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3pm every weekday. Now coming up in this hour, as the government unveils new plans to crack down on extremism, hate preachers exposed by Talk TV are now being investigated by the Charities Commission. And George Galloway takes a dig at politicians, saying he loves the building, but not so much the people in it, as he arrives at Parliament to be sworn in as the new MP for Rochdale. And the Princess of Wales' black sheep uncle, Gary Goldsmith, is set to enter the Celebrity Big Brother house tonight amid fears he could spill secrets about the royal family. All that coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Natalia Walker. Good afternoon. Ministers are set to broaden the government's definition of extremism as part of a crackdown on protesters. The Times reported that Rishi Sunak is consulting with ministers to update the definition, which the government says is no longer being fit for purpose. A new definition, which is still being finalised, is expected to cover those whose actions more broadly undermine the country's values. Former Conservative Party leader Sir Ian Duncan Smith told Talk TV that the threat of extremism extremism is a huge concern for the Prime Minister. Well, there's no question there is extremism in existence. Of course, it's a minority position. The majority of those who live in this country want to get on with their lives. So this is about a minority, but who have a disproportionate effect. 
It comes after George Galloway was criticised by the Prime Minister after his surprising win in the Rochdale by-election. The new MP is set to be sworn in later today, but has received pushback from Sunak, who have described his win as beyond alarming for British democracy. Peter Ford, the deputy leader of the Workers' Party of Britain, told Talk TV the attack on his MP was Sunak's way of trying to scare the public. There was no extremism on display. And what Sunak is doing is trying to whip up hysteria in the hope of rescuing Tory fortunes. It's politicizing of the situation with the Muslim community is quite shameful and dangerous. The vice president of the United States has demanded an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, warning that people there are starving. Kamala Harris says that Israel needs to increase the flow of life-saving assistance into the region during a proposed pause in the fighting. She made the comments as Israel is reported to have boycotted talks with Hamas in Egypt following concerns the terror group would not provide a full list of the hostages that remain alive. The media watchdog Ofcom has ruled that Lawrence Fox's misogynistic comments about female journalist Ava Evans on GB News broke broadcasting rules. The actor turned political activist made the remarks on Dan Wooten's show, which prompted nearly 9,000 complaints, the most complained about TV event last year. Ofcom said Fox's comments were degrading and demeaning both to Miss Evans and women generally. Fox has since been sacked by the channel. Towns across the U.S. have been taken over by an invasion of tumbleweed. Residents in Utah and Nevada have woken up today to find piles of prickly weed reaching over three metres high. In some places, the weeds reach the rooftops after severe winds warnings were issued across the states. And a SpaceX rocket carrying four astronauts has blasted off from Florida in the United States. They're heading to the International Space Station, where they will spend six months studying how diseases affect human organs in low gravity. The capsule they are travelling in has been used in space four times before. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, lots of sun out there today, but rain for some areas. We can see in the earlier radar picture, there's lots of rain piling into the southwest of the UK, as well as across the far northeast over Shetland and Orkney. It's a cloudy, damp picture there. The rain across the southwest will be steadily moving its way northeastwards for this afternoon across Ireland, Wales, the West Country, towards the West Midlands and central southern England later. Everywhere else, mostly fine and bright, perhaps a bit cloudier for eastern England, though. Lots of sunshine and dry weather for mainland. Scotland and Northern England. Later that rain reaches Northern Ireland into this evening and overnight it continues its journey further north and eastwards, eventually over towards the northeast of Scotland and the eastern seaboard of England, turning mostly light and patchy in nature as it does. Further south and west it becomes clear and cold, a chilly night but not as cold as the previous one, but I think we'll still see a frost for many areas as well as areas of mist and fog that will be quite slow to clear through tomorrow. Now tomorrow much uh, of the UK will see sunshine once again but there will be rain across Ireland then Northern Ireland into western parts of Britain later on, mainly showers. And the far northeast of Scotland will also see some spells of rain, but mainly dry and bright elsewhere. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour. Uh, towards the end of the show, though, Alex, so we've got some very important uh, topics to discuss. We always cover the important stuff at the end, don't we? Yes, uh, but some people might find this to be important. They're bringing back Bergerac, which I think I'm right in saying was a smash hit uh, TV drama, BBC, I think, uh, certainly in the 80s, maybe as far back as the 70s, starred uh, John Nettles there as a Jersey detective. Policing the Channel Islands, uh, they're going to make it again, and the the 
cause of our discussion. I'm going to get Ali Ross in from The Sun and just say, as we start a, yet another series of Celebrity Big Brother tonight, they're going to bring back Bergerac. Do they ever have new ideas? Well, Channel it? 4 do it. Most of them should be made illegal, frankly, given the content that Channel 4 spews out. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but I, I don't think Channel 4 ever, ever has new ideas. They just recycle all the ideas only with a sort of porn version. You know? well, yeah, there's a, basically Channel 4 does a porn yeah. version yeah. of everything. What Channel 4 does is it takes any old show and so says, we're going to do it, the, the, exactly that show on Channel 4, only no Nobody will have any clothes on. Yeah, they'll all be nude. Tune in. And then they get all surprised because they don't. Because the people who run Channel 4 are all from The Guardian and they don't understand what people are really like. We're not stupid. Uh, we're not going to tune in the programs. I would say that uh, gladi gladiators, naked. I'm a big fan of that. I made my other half oh, watch it on Saturday night. I was like, come on, it's like a portal to the 90s. It's brilliant. So, you yeah, know, watch gladiators. It's just, it just takes gladiators. me back to childhood. I love it. It's kind of like comforting. And they've not changed anything. There's about one new event, but they've kind of like typecast one of the gladiators as the new wolf type character, the one who goes off in a fit of rage, the vain one. I mean, it's sort of like that even the caricatures are the same and the events are the same. And they haven't got that nice Scottish geese with the whistle. It's a I new don't guy. know, Alex. I didn't watch that. Uh, what's it called? Gladiators? Yeah, I didn't watch that. That's because you were, you're ancient. And I didn't watch Bergerac. It's because not I'm because I'm ancient. And don't challenge me about television because I know more about it than you will ever <laughs> no, know. No, I agree with I that. I just didn't watch it because I was in uh, Los Angeles at the time. Uh, oh, but part uh, of my childhood. Bring, bring, I the point it. is, is bringing it back is the enemy of imagination. They should no, think you know of new like programs. Say, I'd, I'd like to see some of Chris Evans' stuff brought back. It's sort of Ginger Productions mayhem, like TFI Friday and well, Big uh, Breakfast. It's just sort of like mad gorilla. But everything, you know, oh, those are great programs. And Chris did some an amazing program. Yeah. Of course, you can catch him on Virgin Radio. You can our, indeed. Our sister, sister station all day, at breakfast every day. Yeah. Uh, but everything in its time, everything in its time. And you will find if you bring back programs from another era into a new era, they will fail. Having said that, that uh, Gladiators is doing rather well, so I it got is. that wrong. But also, can I Mostly say, everything in its know. time, I just prefer the 90s. It was the peak of civilization. I think the world was just a better place in the 90s no, compared no, to the no. whinging, whining 19th, victimhood culture of today. 1970s, when you could go to a football match and have a fight and nobody whined. It. Oh, see, I don't remember <laughs> that, I'm afraid. I was uh, not even a glint in my mother's eye at that point. But, um, but no, definitely, the 21st century sucks, so why not bring back some of the good stuff? Uh, because it's a bad idea and it never works. You know, they brought back all these dramas. They brought back uh, Minder. That was a big hit in the 70s. And they... And they brought it back and it flops. Every time they bring these programmes back, upstairs, downstairs, utter disaster. Massive hit. I bet hit you if I time. dug around long enough and said, would you bring back this? You'd be like, oh, yeah, I would, actually. Oh, yeah, no, I would. no, yeah, yeah, I, I wouldn't. You. I'm against the very concept. <laughs> Although I do uh, concede that uh, Gladiators, they brought that back and it is doing rather well. It's, I don't know what the viewing figures are. No, it's about it's... six million. Is it? They're, it's, it's a huge. good old show. I get really invested. I was, yell I was watching the indoor athletics championships in Glasgow and sort of right. yelling at the screen about that. Flipped over to Gladiators and was yelling at the screen about that. I just like yelling at the television, basically. I really so. think you've got to get out a bit more though seriously if you're going to be cheering <laughs> at gladiators honestly honestly uh but uh, yeah sickly. lots coming up a sofa night lots still coming up uh, we're going to be talking about prince charles king charles was it, does it say prince did it say prince? it's really you it didn't it didn't i thought it said prince charles. It. king charles uh is vowing to still go to australia had an australian visit planned a proper royal tour and he says he's still going which i think is good news in terms well, of his cancer it does sound like very good news actually it's sort of indicating light at the end of the tunnel yeah. And visits and not just a little, you know, hop, skip and a jump to a local school, but all the way down under, yeah. uh, where he is, of course, still head of state. Uh, we're also going to be talking, our top story today is all about uh, following Rishi Sunak's speech on extremism. What should he actually be doing to tackle it? That's yeah. been our big question of the day, and we want to know what you think on that. So, uh, we've been asking after he denounced the scourge of anti-British extremism, what should Rishi do? Give us a call, 0344 499 1000. If you want to talk to us live on air, let your thoughts be known. Please don't be too nutty, but please do call in because we love hearing your ideas. Or you can text us 8722 if you're feeling a little bit more shy. We'll read them out for you. Write talk before your message. Alternatively, you can join the Elon Musk world of wonder on Twitter. The handle for that is at Talk TV. Yeah, X or Twitter, I guess. Uh, yeah, cross talk.
Uh, so, and we have more, do we? Uh, what are we talking we about? We do, we, we have more, more of, of Here we are, we have some of your text. Have lost dog mode, And tweets was. coming <laughs> up uh, or in on this. Thank you very much, Auto Q. You well be done. as slow as you like, no problem. We'll just invent Thank it. Thank you, yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's easy anyway, just without an Auto Q. Now that Auto Q has finally caught, we're reading these, now that our Auto Q has finally caught up, Hello. Anthony says Islamic extremism began as far back as the early 90s and they are are taking action now after 30 years. Mm, good point. I'll believe it when I see it. A really good point. Yeah. Uh, Martin comments, I think we should have a British Bill of Rights that makes clear what it means to be British. Those that don't want to sign up to it and don't have a British passport should be deported or at least have their visas revoked. Well, if your visas revoked, then you probably should be deported. Now, meanwhile, Mick makes this point. By engaging in two-tier policing and failing to arrest demonstrators for anti-Semitic chants, placards and acts, police chiefs have proved that they are institutionally anti-Semitic. There must be an urgent judicial review with accountability. Well, let's go back to that top story. Hate preachers exposed in an exclusive talk TV report are now being investigated by the Charities Commission. Evidence showing speeches delivered by prescribed terror groups such as Hamas in UK mosques was handed to police in November. While the CPS is still investigating, the Charity Commission says it's assessing the footage following calls to strip the mosques of their charitable status. And the news follows Rishi Sunak's warning outside Downing Street on Friday that British democracy is now under threat by extremism. We are a country where we love our neighbours and we are building Britain together. But I fear that our great achievement in building the world's most successful multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy is being deliberately undermined. There are forces here at home trying to tear us apart. Ministers are now looking to further crack down on extremism by broadening the government's definition of the term and introducing a dedicated unit to combat extremist groups and individuals. Uh, joining us now in the studio is Holly Hudson, Talk TV correspondent, and uh, we uh, will soon be joined. Uh, I think we are being joined also uh, by Colonel Simon Diggins, uh, former defence attaché in Kabul from 2008 until 2010. We'll talk to Simon in just a moment, but first, Holly, uh, can you give us the background to this? So, back in November, Talk TV found a number of sermons from a number of figures at different mosques across the country containing anti-Semitic rhetoric. Rhetoric, for example, like destroy Israelis and come and kill Jewish people. We put that content to the relevant police forces. As it stands at this point, we asked for an update today. At least three of them, West Yorkshire, West Midlands and the Met, are still investigating whether any offences have been committed. Uh, hate crimes, of course. And one force, Northamptonshire, has sent its files to the CPS for a charging decision which has yet to be made. So, at this stage, there are four police forces that are investigating a number of mosques, um, assessing evidence to determine whether or not any offences, any hate crimes, have been committed. Now, the Charities Commission have been looking into this since our investigation. The Charities Commission are responsible for these mosques, in a sense, because they are members of registered charities. So, in essence, they could be stripped of their charitable status if they are found to be guilty of any offences committed. Um, now, though, a number of groups, including the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism, is piling the pressure on the Commission for some sort of resolution to conclude this investigation into these mosques. Now, um, a statement from the Campaign Against Anti-Semitism said, some of these sermons are utterly repugnant. The language used and the approval of or calls for violence are totally unacceptable. We're investigating each of these incidents and we'll be making referrals to the Charity Commission and where relevant, the police, which we know has, of, of course, happened. There must be no place for religious extremism in Britain. The Charities Commission have told us that it is assessing the talks for any potential regulatory action and if they find there has been any wrongdoing, they will take action. So they have vowed that they will take action uh, in the sort of due course. This does come, of course, though, as you've already mentioned, um, after calls from the ho former Home Office Minister, Robert Jenner, to take sterner action to tackle the cancer of Islamist extremism and the extraordinary intervention by the Prime Minister on Friday, warning against the poison of extremism. He, uh, Rishi Sunak said 
He feared Britain's great achievement of multi-ethnic, multi-faith democracy was now being deliberately undermined by both Islamists and the far right. And that is an important point to make. There has also been a rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes in the UK since October 7th. We're fast approaching five months since October 7th massacres. But Jewish groups, of course, in particular, feel that enough hasn't been done in that space of time to tackle anti-Semitism in the UK, which, as we know, has soared since that day. Holly, thank you ever so much. Well, let's now talk to Colonel Simon Diggins. Uh, Simon, do you know, it seems to me that this new raft of measures being proposed to come up with a definition for extremism and set up a few more bodies to tackle extremism, well, it rather seems to me like a load of bump that we heard from Tony Blair and successive prime ministers ever since. But nothing seems to here to be concrete. It's very easy, I think, to see who's doing the wrongdoing, who they're influenced by, and even forensically where they're getting money from. But the point of the matter is people have then got to act on it, surely. No, I agree. There's, I mean, you say, the, the first so prime ministerial statement on uh, Islamist extremism came from Tony Blair in 2005. And there have been successive conversations, statements, public, public announcements by uh, governments of all stripes, all colours. And we still are now in the situation we are now, where there is elements within the, 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 uh, the Muslim community who are basically, there is an element of extremism there, and that needs to be cut out. We need to find some way of dealing with that. Uh, it does not help that we've got some mix out over, over terminology. I mean, so any criticism of Islam, of, of Islam is automatically deemed to be Islamophobia. That is simply not right. I mean, it is perfectly reasonable for Islam as a religion to be treated like every other religion in this country. You cannot have a situation whereby a particular religion is in fact off off bounds and out out of out of out of criticism because then you allow space which we've now got space for the extremists who distort the picture of islam to come to the fore and that's a real danger uh, simon uh, i've i remember the report and it was back in november so what are we now three months on from that yeah uh and uh you know far be it for me to pre predict the uh, outcome of these investigations. But if you lift, listen to the texts of what these preachers were saying, it seems to me uh, these are open and shut cases of anti-Semitic hate speech, the calling for the death of Jews, the annihilation of the Israeli state. Uh, so it doesn't seem to me to be that difficult in terms of whether or not crimes are being committed here. So why do you think it has taken so long to get to a point where the Charities Commission are saying, oh, we're assessing it, Four, three months on, we're assessing what they said, and meanwhile, uh, only one police force has referred their investigation to the Crown Prosecution Service when there were, I think, uh, there were several police forces involved. Why does it take so long? In my view, <laughs> potentially, do you think that this shows a lack of resolve on the part of our authorities? Simon, we really do want to we'll listen get, we'll to get, uh, we'll, we've lost your, connection. Uh, your... But, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because one thing I do want to ask Simon is the fact that we are going to be going live to Parliament a bit later to watch George Galloway being sworn in by his old mucker, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, fellow Hamas sympathiser, but also by uh, the, the leader of the House, who, frankly, has to turn up and do it because someone's got to. You've got to have two... Bottom, really. Yeah, you've got to have two people sort of give you away, walk David you down Davis the aisle, if you will. Yeah, no right-minded uh, MP actually wants to do it. But it's interesting because, you know, part of what's gone on recently, and we've seen this in the election of George Galloway in Watchdale, is this mobilisation of a Muslim vote, a sectarianism being introduced in politics. And one thing that struck me as quite harrowing, listening to some of his uh, welcome speeches, um, his sort of, you know, celebratory speeches, is he says he's got deputies now across basically that flank of Greater Manchester, across Yorkshire, across Lancashire, people who want to represent his vile anti-Semitic extremist party. Um, well, actually, we've got Simon Diggins back, so let's ask him that question. Simon, hopefully we've got a clear What about my now. question? Why is it taking so long, Simon? 
Why is it taking so long for the authorities to get round to? A, uh, only one police force has handed their file to the CPS. None of the others have. This is dating back uh, three months to November, and the Charity Commission has just said, we're assessing what these people said. As I said earlier, if you actually listen to what they said, looks like a pretty open and shut case of anti-Semitic hate speech to me. Why do we drag our heels so much? Does that reveal, does that expose a lack of resolve on the part of our authorities? I think because there's an institutional issue here. The institutional issue was highlighted really well by William Shawcross, uh, who, who helped set up the prevent uh, system within our country, who, when he, his report last year, which has literally been updated within the last month, said that the definition of Islamophobia had been, had been narrowed right down. So it was really quite hard to actually say to be effectively to uh, to do that, whereas the definition of the of so-called extreme right ideology was very very broad. So actually, it's very difficult to persuade anybody, even like institutionally, if they're taking guidance from the government itself as to what is actually acceptable speech uh, on on anything to do with uh, Islamists versus the, the 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 very broad guidance to do with anything to do with the extreme right. So you have a sort of institutional bias within the system which says actually that you know, Islamists can say a great deal and often really vile and unpleasant stuff, and effectively get away with it. Whereas if somebody who they deem to be extreme right, um, it's quite a, quite a broad definition. So I think there's an institutional issue around that. I totally agree with you, though. What uh, you, you've exposed in Talk TV is some simply simply outrageous statements, which, regardless of the fact that the, the war that's ongoing at the moment, should be completely unacceptable as it is, and suggests a significant failure within the institutions uh, and uh, the, particularly our government institutions and the way in which they approach uh, Islamism. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, Simon, is the fact that Rishi Sunak said extremism is now in our democracy, uh, in alluding to, one imagines, the election of George Galloway. But George Galloway, in, in his sort of early acceptance speeches, was bragging, essentially, about having deputies for his Workers' Party across that flank of uh, Greater Manchester, Yorkshire and Lancashire. And we also know there's an organisation called The Muslim Vote who want to sort of uh, curate these sort of ideological voting blocks attached to one particular religion. How worried should we be? about sectarianism entering our politics? Uh, they're extremely worried. I mean, we, we've got examples in our own country, the United Kingdom, what happens when politics gets taken over by, by sectarianism in Northern Ireland. You know, so we have a very clear example of where that happened. And indeed, you know, there are other examples in the past when the sectarianism was Catholicism versus Protestantism. So we understand what happens. It always ends badly because people believe, rightly or wrongly, when you have a sectarian, uh, if you like, imperative behind whatever you're saying that they have got if you like god on their side um, and, and therefore their their, their behavior and their extremism is often much worse than even the sort of the, the to and fro of, of what you might call secular secular politics so sectarianism is, is a real danger danger to us it leads people astray they believe their god-given right to say what they like they believe they've got god on their side and they'll do and actually do do terrible things again as shawcross pointed out you know, regardless of what people say about the sort of threat of the, from the, the extreme right, you know, in terms of actual actual terrorist attacks in this country, you know, essentially, their Islamist groups have done this. And until we actually recognise the kind of reality of that, we're never actually going to get a grip of it. Just couldn't yeah. have put it better myself. Thank you so Thank much, you. Simon. So Great much, to Simon. talk to you. Well, your texts and tweets have been coming in on this very topic. Anthony says, if the police are to ever gain control over these marches, then only a maximum number of demonstrators should be allowed to join them. And meanwhile, Amanda has this to say. The Gaza situation has brought things to a head, along with the influence of the left in all its guises. War is being waged from within, and Sunak hasn't got a clue what to do about it. Extremely worrying times. It does feel extremely worrying now. Coming up after the break, a badly behaved uncle is at risk of embarrassing the royals. Where have we heard that one before? <laughs> this time, though, it's Kate Middleton's uncle who is set to enter the celebrity Big Brother house. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, oi, treacle.
when JK Rowling says, let's just be honest. It's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, miss it. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. That. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips, and this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the Princess of Wales' family have reportedly read the riot act to Kate's uncle, Gary Goldsmith, who is set to appear on the new series of Celebrity Big Brother, which launches tonight. The outspoken businessman, brother to Kate's mother, Carol Middleton, has infuriated the family, who are already grappling with social media speculation surrounding Princess Kate's wearing whereabouts as she continues to recover from abdominal surgery. Well, joining us now is royal commentator Michael Cole. Oh, it never rains, but it pours, doesn't it, for the royal family? I mean, this can't, can't really be the most settling news to listen uh, to hear during her recuperation, that her mother, wayward uncle, is uh, going to be earning a bob or two. I would imagine the ITV are hoping for spilling some secrets. Good afternoon, Alex. Uh, good afternoon, Kevin. Yeah, uh, snap opinion polls show that t nearly two thirds of the people think it's a bad idea for bad Uncle Gary to go into the celebrity Big Brother house. So obviously the Middleton family have been furiously dialing all day uh, to get the figures on the right side of the equation. And here we see uh, Uncle Gary, and I think that was when he went into court uh, for assaulting uh, his fourth wife. Uh, for that, he got a fine of £5,000 and a community order. And of course, he is uh, what they call a colourful character. <laughs> Why has he been invited onto the Big Brother set? Well, because, and only one reason, he is the uncle. Uh, his niece is going to be, in all likelihood, the next uh, Queen of England. And why, have they, why do they want him? Not for his scintillating personality, but because he's likely to spill the beans, as you say, say a few indiscreet things about life inside the royal family. And it has to be said, Kevin and Alex, that he has form. 
In the past, he said some very disobliging things about Prince Harry uh, and Meghan Markle, presumably thinking that he's aiding the case of his uh, niece, the Princess of Wales. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, the Middletons, and I'm sure the royal family as such, uh, are not welcoming this addition because he's an unexploded bomb. They don't know what's coming next. And people do say very, very stupid things when they're in front of the television camera. We three tried to avoid that happening. Yeah, well, uh, with varying <laughs> degrees of success, uh, with me, in my case, not very good degrees of success. Uh, but to be serious for a second, Gary Goldsmith, as you said, Michael, he's got a conviction for punching his wife. Uh, he has been widely reported to stage all these drug parties. Uh, his wife said that when she pun he punched her, he was on drugs. Uh, so, he, you know, he's a... As you said, to put it generously, he's a colourful character, he's a different character. Uh, my question to you, uh, you worked in the TV industry, I have, I've written extensively about it, so, so I suppose I'm not awfully surprised, but, you know, is it right that uh, ITV are cashing in on this guy when poor Kate is trying to recover from serious abdominal surgery? Would not ITV have been better advised uh, to just not go down this route? It's all a bit tawdry and uncomfortable, don't you think? Yeah, Kevin, I, I, those are counsels of perfection, and I have to say I, I thoroughly agree with you. It is quite true that he was involved in drug drugs parties on Ibiza, where he lived for some time, but it's also true uh, that the Prince of Wales and the Princess of Wales, before the birth of Prince George, did actually go out there and have, have holidays with him. So he, he is something in the family that, that He's there, he's permanent, they can't get rid of him. On occasions when uh, he's uh, allowed to come into the royal circle, like a wedding, he's sort of hidden behind a local pillar and so on. Uh, it is unfortunate, particularly at this time, because I think the, uh, the focus should be on good wishes, which we collectively send to the Princess of Wales in her recovery, which we are, understand is going well, uh, and so should it. Uh, it's not helpful, uh, but you see what happens. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of personal experience. 25 years ago, a long time ago, a quarter of a century, I was asked to go on uh, Celebrity Big Brother. Well, in those days, uh, I think I was at the bottom of the pecking order, but they offered me £40,000. Uh, it's a lot of money involved. And that, with inflation, it's reported that Sharon Osborne, who is one of the people who are also going into the Celebrity Big, uh, big Brother house, uh, are getting £100,000 a day. Well, if you're in there for three weeks, I can't quite do the, the maths, but it's something like £3 million, isn't it? <laughs> something like that. Um, and uh, uh, money is at stake. Maybe he needs the money, but it is the sort of headache uh, that Carol Middleton, mother of Kate, certainly doesn't need. And I'm quite sure she's uh, holding her breath, putting her tin hat on and hoping nothing comes out of it. But even experienced people who've been in the Big Brother house, and I think Jenny Bond, who succeeded me as BBC Royal Correspondent, she said she found herself saying things that she didn't realise she was saying, uh, <laughs> forgetting that the cameras were always there. I think that's the idea, that's Michael. Point, that's yeah. the idea. If, honestly, if people could see what we talk about during our advert breaks, yeah. off, Ofcom would shut us down. <laughs> uh, but let's talk uh, about Camilla, who is taking a break. She's had to obviously pick up the slack with the absence of both uh, Kate and the King himself. Uh, she's now taking a break herself. Uh, and we've also learned that the King is still planning to go to Australia at some point this year, uh, hoping, therefore, that he's going to make a full recovery uh, from this battle with cancer. Yeah, and there we see the Queen. Uh, she's 76. Now, she's still five years younger than me. I'm 81 on Wednesday, but I'm reversing the numbers, transposing them, and I shall be 18 from now on. Uh, but, but she wants a break. She has been at the forefront of the royal... Uh, procession. And of course, she was the leading character at a great gathering of European royalty uh, last Tuesday at uh, Michael, at George's Michael, sorry to interrupt. Yes, We're going to have to segue to Parliament to uh, pay uh, tribute to George Galloway. Thank you very much you. to Michael Gosh. Cole uh, from the Royals, as I say, to Westminster now. Rochdale's new MP, George Galloway, is being sworn into the House of Commons yeah. this afternoon.
It's you, Alex. Well, on his way to Parliament, <laughs> he told press he was feeling good about his official appointment to the House of Commons, one of the only people who is, and that he's always loved the building, less so the people in it. Uh, so here we go. My understanding is that uh, he is going to be walked down the aisle, so to speak, by his old mucker. There he is. With, there he is. Oh, he's with I've got Pete, my glasses on. He's supposed to be with see. Peter Bottomley and, I believe, Jeremy Corbyn. There is two oh, there he M is. MP sponsors. Uh, but Peter Bottomley being the th father of the house, is that right? Let's have a look. There's George. Look, he hasn't got his fedora on, uh, so I was right, he is bald. Uh, there's uh, Lindsay Hoyle. Bob uh, Blyford. Of... Question number one, Mr Speaker. Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With your permission, I will take questions 1 and 17 together. We are investing almost £2.4 billion over three years to tackle homelessness and rough sleeping. These are unprecedented... Well, there's some of the uh, less exciting events that are taking place in uh, Parliament today, but joining us to explain it all is uh, Alicia. Um, so, George Galloway, he is now sworn in. That is protocol, isn't it, that you essentially walked into Parliament by two extant MPs, people who are already sitting on those green benches, who essentially sponsor your entrance into the House of Commons, but this is, you know, history making, whether you like it or not. It was, and what's really interesting is apparently David Davis uh, was also asked to be part of this, and he actually turned it down, having known George Galloway for a really long time. He did say, he, did, he said yes, because he believes in free speech. He doesn't agree with George Galloway, but he believes in free speech. But then uh, George Galloway's deputy for his British Workers' Party, whatever they're called, uh, uh, Chris Williamson, who was even Jeremy Corbyn kicked out of the Labour uh, parliamentary group for being anti-Semitic. Uh, David Davis said, well, I'm not given that Chris Williamson is now actually being investigated for the police but for more anti-Semitic hate speech. Uh, David pulled out, uh, so it was Corbyn and Bottomley. Yeah, and Peter Bottomley is known as the father of the house because he is uh, the longest serving, oldest MP uh, there. So it's kind of part of his duty as such is to do these kinds of things. But he's going to have an interesting reception in the past few days, I think, George Galloway, because I think in the past two times that he's been in Parliament, let's remember he was a Labour MP, then an MP for the Respect Party. His popularity has dwindled even between those two occasions, let alone now. So if we look back to maybe when he was first a Labour MP, he was quite a popular figure of the left. I mean, controversial nonetheless, but still had quite a few MPs in Parliament who would really support him. And now if you really look at it, we're trying to think who his main allies would be. I mean, there's people like Jeremy Corbyn, who I imagine will probably be quite on side with George Galloway. I mean, none, not least because they're both slightly people who've been shafted from the mainstream of politics. And I think lots of them will they maybe find some kind of friendship uh, between them. Um, but looking a bit further afield, I mean, I mean he's not going to be friends with Keir Starmer. He's not going to have Rishi Sunak on side. He's not going to have any of the real leading figures. So it's going to be an interesting few days for him. Let's remind ourselves of what the Prime Minister said in Downing Street on Friday. Very early on in his speech, uh, in which he talked of the scourge, of the rising scourge of extremism, this is what he said. It is beyond alarming that last night the Rochdale by-election returned a candidate that dismisses the horror of what happened on the 7th of October, who glorifies Hezbollah and is endorsed by Nick Griffin, the racist former leader of the British National Party. Uh, with that kind of endorsement, he's not going to get very many friends in Parliament, is he? He's not, but also I don't think he really wants very many friends in yeah. Parliament. I think he's made that very clear. I think he's quite happy to be the outlier. He's quite happy to be this man who's seen as kind of an enemy to the government and also the main opposition parties as well. And I think also the fact that he's now going to be the only MP from his party means that he's going to kind of be that person who says, you know, I'm representing something that no one else here stands for. And I think he quite enjoys that. Well, Donald yeah. Dewar, I think, was the uh, leader of the Scottish Labour Party for a while. And uh, when Galloway was in Parliament, then I think for respect, he said, Donald, why do people just immediately, instantly hate me? And uh, Donald Dewar said, because it saves time, yeah. George. <laughs> pretty I much mean, sums up Galloway, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> when you think about it, when you look at the turnout in that constituency and how many votes got in that election, um, it's, uh, you know, but fewer than 20,000. And yet he's going to have a position on those back benches where I think, you know, media will hang on his every word, publicise everything he says, he'll become a big name, he'll cause the government one heck of a headache.
Definitely. I think the general assumption and prediction, and obviously no one can really predict it because no one knows exactly what will happen at the general election, but lots of people assume that the likelihood is that he will be the MP for Rochdale until the, uh, Dale, until the election, and then potentially we might see a change because at every general election, the turnout is usually a lot bigger than it is at by-elections, so we'll probably see a lot more of the constituents actually have their say uh, and put their votes in. And we also don't know how he's going to act as their MP during that time as well. We don't know whether he's going to make his constituents really happy or not. And that, there's so much that could possibly change in that time period. I think he's going to make his Muslim uh, constituents happy. As he proved, this is for Gaza, not for Rochdale then. I mean, he seems to be he's more already, interested in a war two and a half thousand miles away. I find fascinating. He's already said in his acceptance speech when he had that sort of strangely held samosas uh, yeah, celebration yeah. in the local yeah. garage that uh, yeah. it was going to be an yeah. Israel-free yeah. zone in Rochdale. Oh, yes, I think that's the thing that people are probably going to take issue with uh, about his appointment the most and it was that focus on the conflict in the Middle East it was the fact that he made it quite clear that That's that the about, way yeah. that he won this this by-election was because of his stance on the Middle East rather than his stance for the people of Rochdale he did obviously reference a few things about local issues but it was very clear that the focus was definitely this conflict that's happening elsewhere let me put you on the spot I don't know if you know about this but what is the meaning of this uh, they, they love their silly little traditions don't they <laughs> silly and, <laughs> They are pathetic. Oh, it's really important we maintain tradition. Why? Uh, so what is this all about where two MPs have to hold him by the hand and drag him to the dispatch box? I, I think you've probably hit the nail on the head there about it just being a silly tradition. <laughs> <laughs> just like, just like <laughs> not silly. <laughs> Honestly, you may as well join this party if you think these great sort of no, emblems of our British democracy but I mean, are it's silly. Just the same. I mean, of course in they're Parliament, silly. If you walk around What's Parliament, the point of it? there's What's a the... lot of... It's silly. I mean that in a light way. I don't mean that seriously. I don't. I, don't. I mean, it's silly. <laughs> it's pompous. <laughs> Silly. ceremony though it's very it's very british it's the way that our parliament works it's the way it always has worked and it's the way that parliament sticks to tradition yeah he looks different, doesn't he, now well, that he's bald without his fedora? Don't you have to swear when you're being uh, uh, indicted... Not indicted, what am I saying? <laughs> uh, There's a word beginning with Freudian. you and I can't think of what it is. Uh, when you're being induced, it, there you go. Introduced, introduced. 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 Uh, not induced. With... <laughs> not being born. Look, I'm under the weather, I can't help it. <laughs> you have to swear on some sort of text of your choice and I was trying to see whether it was a particular holy book he was going for then. Yeah, that would be really interesting, actually. Mm. I couldn't quite tell from, from that, but we can definitely look into it but yes I think the whole point in swearing in really is to kind of promise that you will speak the truth that you'll follow Commons cha uh, chamber rules that you won't break any kind of parliamentary codes of conduct from that moment mm. onwards and then basically if you do do that uh, the Speaker of the House can always reference the moment that you swore in and say, you know, you swore in... Uh, it's like kind of like swearing on oath before mm. a legal case, okay. right? Oh, cool. Similar sure. to that, um, they can draw on that and say, well, you agreed to this and now you've broken that rule. See, it is like being indicted after all. Yeah. <laughs> induced. 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 Well, I'm going to induce an advert break now and coming up <laughs> after that, 80s detective drama Bergerac is the latest franchise to be dusted off for a TV comeback. But have we finally run out of ideas for the small screen? I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. I might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. 
What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Worm is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are joined now by our very own Mike Graham to give us a little taster ahead of his show tonight, The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, which is, of course, at its brand new time of 8 pm until 10 pm. Uh, you won't want to miss a second. I'll get that one out of the way first. Great night on Friday. Uh, Mike, have you recovered yet? Uh, tell us what's on your show. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you look a lot better now than you did then, I have to say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, having a great time uh, tonight. We've got lots going on. I'm getting a guinea pig in the studio, um, apparently, because there's a guinea pig, apparently, that needs a new home. Yeah. I'm not saying we're going to home the guinea pig that needs a new home, but we're going to have a guinea pig in the studio, uh, not for the first time. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if it's going to attack me. I don't know what I'm supposed to do with it, or whether I'm going to stroke it, but that's the one big thing we're doing tonight. Also, a um, couple of interesting stories on the go. I've discovered that wind farms in this country cost us over £300 million a year uh, not to operate, right? Well, and guess where most of the money goes? £275 million of the money that we give to wind farms goes to Scotland. And guess what Scotland keep doing? They keep giving more permissions to more companies to build more wind farms so that they get paid even more money for producing no energy. It's such a racket, I can't believe it. And most of those windmills come from China, right? So, yes, they uh, do, yeah. This but, is not so very we're, we're ecological. Paying, we're paying people to build uh, wind farms. The two most expensive ones get 40 million a year each. They're all in the North Sea, offshore. They, they get paid more money to produce nothing than to produce any kind of energy. So here's, a, here's an idea. You and I will form a wind farm company. We will put a wind farm in the North Sea and it will do nothing and we can make about 40 million a year. That's we brilliant. That's brilliant. And also, Mike, you can join my campaign to lower awareness of climate change, of the climate change. <laughs> we love change. lowering awareness <laughs> to on reduce this show. awareness. Yeah, and also, I like the idea <laughs> of uh, having a show. I was saying to Kev ages ago, Crosstalk needed some sort of emotional support animal. And uh, instead, yes. we've got a, a, a range of presenter friends. But I'm still pitching to have some sort of bunny rabbit or a tarantula. Oh, or what about we can borrow Mike's yeah. guinea pig? Yeah. I mean, if, you want, guinea pig. if you want, I'll sell you, uh, I'll sell you my second hand guinea pig. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. happen to have a guinea I'm pig in. going to spare yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah anything, really else, Mike? anything else we need to know about the show tonight uh, also we're going to have a look at this story of the guy who's in the sas who uh, they're trying to send to prison because he doesn't want to give evidence to an inquest for obvious reasons because he doesn't want to be identified he took part uh, in an ambush of some ira killers back in 1991 one of whom was the cousin of the current um, First Minister of Northern Ireland, believe it or not. Uh, the three IRA guys were all killed. They're trying to put this guy in prison for contempt of court because he can't reveal his identity. It's unbelievable. We'll be talking about that wow. as well. Sounds like a great show. Uh, so tune in to the Independent Republic of Mike Graham tonight at 8 pm. You do not, not want to miss a second. second. Cheers, Mike. <laughs> I always sort of wait with bated breath for my cue of when yeah, I've got yeah. to jump do in not and do that miss a in second. synchronized fashion. It's not easy, you know. We're well, moving on now. And in the title role.
It's the latest show to get a dusting off from the vault with Celebrity Big Brother relaunching on ITV tonight and Gladiators back in a primetime weekend slot. So the big question is, have we actually just run out of ideas for what should be on the box? Uh, joining us now uh, to discuss this uh, very important issue is the uh, Sun's brilliant TV critic, Ali Ross. Uh, I've got a few others uh, that have come back uh, uh, over the years, Ali. Uh, a fortune on Saturday as well, of course. I mean... Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I think they should bring back that Chris on. Tarrant show, Man Oh Man, where they so, all had to stand by a swimming pool and get Sean pushed Sean O'Brien won the first yeah. episode of that. That's right, you did, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Right, uh, Big Brother, Celebrity Big Brother coming back tonight. Survivor, Baker, Biker Grove, Deal or No Deal, Upstairs, Downstairs, Minder, Crossroads, they all came back and they all failed. When are these people in television going to realise that it's once bitten, twice shy, when you bring back these classics, it doesn't seem to work? Well, do you know what? Just this morning, I was watching Shogun, the new Disney+. Plus. Oh. And I thought, this is, this is amazing, this is new. I've not, then, of course, it's 1980. Old. It's old. Richard yeah. Chamberlain. Yeah. Oh, I would have to say this version is much better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. OK, but, uh, but what, what about have, Bergerac? I, I loved Bergerac. Brilliant series. Uh, a vehicle not just for Nettles, but for Charlie Hungerford, mm -hmm. who was the Yorkshire yes, wide course, boy. Right. Uh, I thought I loved the Bergerac. Yeah. Uh, and, very uh, underrated series. So also a vehicle for my wife. She starred in it once. No uh, way. She, when she was a feature writer for The Sun, they sent her to Jersey to interview John Nettles and stuff. And, you and, they, and they were looking for a background crowd person, but they, somebody had to look like a Russian spy. And the director <laughs> said to Henrietta, you'd be perfect, do you mind doing this? So she ended up in the show as a Russian well, spy. Well, she should be very proud of that IMDb entry because it was a good series. It was a good series, it, it was. was. Yeah. And they're saying that obviously it's not going to be John Nettles as Bergerac. I didn't watch the original Bergerac. I was too young, evidently. Um, but who do you think's built to be Bergerac now yeah, in the remake? Yeah, good question. Well, I, w I would imagine they use it as a chance to tick a box. Mm. So it wouldn't be some sort of suave, sophisticated, like... Mind goes blank. There aren't that many now, are there? Yeah. Uh, so, who do you think it'll be? Uh, Anthony Joshua or something? Anthony well, Tiny Temper. Quite probably Lenny Henry. You know. <laughs> Lenny Henry. He's not on nearly enough. <laughs> <laughs> and now that he's going to be missing for Red Nose Day, I mean, we need him on some drama or other. How, how will we ever cope? Yeah, I mean, you know, I love his TV adverts for that hotel chain, uh, but we need him more on dramas and comedies, don't we? Come on, Lenny, where are yeah. you hiding? Yeah, because he was a very, very funny comedian, wasn't he? I mean, you make him faulty <laughs> towers as well, or did I just... Yeah, that's that right, sort good of like, one, good one, they I are. I don't often know stuff about telly, it's but that I knew. It's all gone very quiet on that, because it was so badly received when he... Announced. The idea. Yeah, yeah, that he was going to make it set in the West Indies, with Basil having retired out there, he's just got fed up with Britain. But... It, you're not going to do it better than the original. It was no, it also in today's sort of woke perfection. politically correct society. Faulty Towers, based in the West Indies, is just a minefield of offence waiting to yeah, happen. Yeah, why is it based it? in the West Indies? Because John Cleese <laughs> has got a house there. Simple yeah. as that. Uh, but so, uh, what do you make of uh, this guy, Gary Goldsmith, Kate's, uh, the Princess of Wales' uncle, being taken into or going into the Celebrity Big Brother house tonight? Uh, I'm thinking uh, she's recovering from abdominal surgery. Mm. She doesn't need her convicted domestic abuser uncle, uh, famous for being outspoken and making life worse for her. ITV, you know, they might come to rue this decision it's to really, cash in on this guy. It's really tawdry. It is, isn't it? Uh, there's a, it's not every member of the royal family that has a well of affection and respect, but I think Kate Middleton does. She does, yeah. There's something really admirable about her. Yeah. And she's sick. Know, she's just, sick. She's just doing it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. There's I no good wonder. reason, actually, to That's do it. Where these, to do right. And I, I just wonder where these TV channels get off on paying people vast sums of money who have, you know, had previous convictions and drug offences and beaten up their ex-wives. I mean, is there no decorum in let's not give money to wrongans anymore? The weird thing about this celebrity big is that when they brought back the civilian version, it... It made its debut on ITV and then they quickly shunted it to ITV2. But as far as I can see from the schedules, this is staying on the main channel as well. Well, good luck with it, but uh, uh, the, the, the... It's not the, an ITV show. The, the law uh, in these circumstances, when you bring back these old uh, classics mm. that were successful, it's the law of diminishing, diminishing returns. They never do as well as they did the first time. Very, very rarely that does this, any sort of... The classic case in movies is The Godfather 2, which is better than the, 
And they, the Alien, original. Alien 2, I think, is better than the original. Uh, we, well. Well, we've opened a sequel. Uh, uh, also, <laughs> Terminator. Terminator 2 is better than the original. Some you know, people I was think. just thinking, judging by we're the time frame... We're on a different tangent <laughs> now, aren't we? Judging by the time frame of the 90s till today to bring things back, by the time they bring back Crosstalk Mark 2, I'm going to be in my 70s and you'll be dead. I'll be dead. <laughs> I'll be dead by tomorrow, the way things are going, I'll tell you. I think that's me, actually. Yeah. Uh, Ali, thank you ever so much. I always Pleasure. love her picking your brains over television. Ali Ross, the brilliant uh, TV critic of the sun there. Sadly, though, Alex, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join us same time tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Up next, though, is JJ Anasiobi. He is standing in for Ian Collins. Have a very good afternoon, and we'll see you bright and early, 9.30 in the morning tomorrow. Bye-bye. today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman, trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. You might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, missing. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> 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 <laughs>